Welcome back to another Stat 432 video. Um, so honestly, the main topic of this video is going to be something called the bias variance trade-off. Uh, but I sort of wanted to talk about a few other related concepts. So we're sort of going to call this a supervised learning concepts video. Uh, but again, so we're mostly going to talk about the bias variance trade-off, but it relates to uh, overfitting and model flexibility. Um, which sort of relates back to this idea of there's no free lunch, which, I mean, as an undergrad, you might think, well, if I join certain organizations, I will get a free lunch, but we're talking about something different. Um, and then we'll sort of end with a, a note about the curse of dimensionality, which is not super tied to what we're saying here, but we kind of need to say that before we move on to other things. So I'm going to mention it here. Okay, let's get started. So... I want to talk about this idea of expected prediction error and what we're trying to predict is this quantity y which we believe is sort of roughly of the form f of x plus epsilon where f of x is sort of the signal and epsilon is the noise and what we want to do is estimate that with f hat of x which is an estimate of f uh, at a particular x so when x is some little x and so oh i need to get rid of myself bye um, so rather than write this expression out, which I think you could um, uh, guess would be horrible in my handwriting. So what I have here is this expression for what we call the expected uh, prediction error. And the details are not super important. But what is important is that it decomposes into two things. Uh, that is what we call the reducible error and the irreducible error. So the irreducible error here, which we see is basically the conditional variance of y given x. Well, so that's, you know, how much does you know i mean lines are a bad way to draw variance but how much does how much does the data vary about the true regression function at any particular x okay so that's the idea of the uh conditional variance i didn't make these easy to erase oh but i need to be smarter about how to use an ipad okay well let's talk about the reducible error right so what is that so let's say that we fit some model to this data and we get an estimated regression function of something like that so that's our f hat of x well what the reducible error is is basically the uh, expected square difference between these two things at any particular x and the names here are very indicative so irreducible error is something we can never get rid of right because there's noise around the true regression function, there's always going to be some error in the predictions we make. I mean, that's just, that's how the way it is. But the reducible error is what we have um, sort of control over. Um, that is, you know, we can do a better job getting our um, estimate to better match the truth. Uh, so that's what we're going to focus on next. Uh, this quantity uh, we will call the mean squared uh, error, I'll say MSE, and I'll write it nicely so you can see what it is. Uh, and this is, in this formulation here, well, this is the variance of epsilon. Not super important, but um, just a note there. Okay, so before we go any further, we need to recall some definitions. Um, and that is, if we have some estimator uh, theta hat for some quantity theta, what is the bias of that estimator? And what is the variance of that estimator? And here we see the two definitions. Hopefully you've seen these before. I'm almost certain you have, but let's uh, maybe talk about some intuition behind them real quick. Um, oh no, I have to tell a joke. It's a good thing I, um, I left this note here for myself. Okay, so here we go. Um, one of my only jokes that I can tell uh, about uh, machine learning. Um, so two statisticians go hunting, well, let's say deer hunting. And um, they both see a deer and they both shoot at it. And uh, one misses 10 feet to the left, the other misses 10 feet to the right. Oh, I forgot, there's a third statistician. Uh, the third statistician jumps up and screams, we hit it. Okay, so I one botched the joke and two, it's not gonna begin with. I should note that no deer were harmed in the making of this joke, uh, but I digress. Okay, so you may have seen this picture before. Uh, if you're wondering why the circles are not quite all of, you know, equal distance away from the previous one, that's because I drew them in the iPad and I can only do so good. 
because I didn't want to just steal the image from every data science blog post I've ever seen and, you know, risk copyright issues. Anyway, so, you know, pretend you're, you're throwing darts at a dartboard. And here are sort of like four ways you could do that. You know, the goal is to hit the middle. So in the top row here, we would have what we call low bias which means that on average, if we sort of start thinking about averaging our points, they're basically hitting the bullseye. Whereas in the bottom row, this would be high bias. So on average, we're off target. So it's sort of like a systematic bias. Uh, so the left column, this would be low variance. So we, we, we see that all of our shots are close together, um, but they're not necessarily correct as in the bottom picture. And then in the next column over, we would have what we call high variance. So, um, you know, I think it should be pretty clear here. The top left is what we're looking for. The bottom right is what we're absolutely hoping to avoid, but the bottom left and top right, well, which of these is preferable, right? So, um, you know, in statistics, we, we really, really, really uh, harp on, we want unbiased estimators. But um, if we think about these, you know, in terms of average distance from the target, it's actually kind of unclear which of these is better. That is uh, this one or this one. Um, so we're gonna need a different metric. Uh, before we get to that, I wanna reinforce this idea of what the bias and the variance are. So um and i'm gonna sort of speak in general because most of the time we're gonna be talking about an estimation at a particular x or point wise but uh, i'm gonna speak a little bit more generally for a second so here we have three data sets they were all generated from the same data generating process which is actually not plotted here anyway because that's not i don't care how accurate we are right now um so they're all generated from the same process but it's you know three random samples and then to this we fit two models um, and I sort of use the R notation. One is an intercept only model. So that's the blue dashed line each time. Uh, and the other was a polynomial model of degree nine. And what I want you to notice is two things. Um, the blue dashed line, it's wrong, right? So it, it's pretty consistently wrong. Uh, if we average across the three different lines, it's basically the same line and it's just wrong. So it's biased. Um, however, it's pretty similar in each picture. So it's very low variance. The orange line is the exact opposite. So it's hard to see, but if you average across the three and if we did more and more of these and we average them, we would be getting a pretty nice uh, mean function, but that's hard to see, so don't worry about that. What's very obvious is that we see with different data, we get a very different result. So we say that it's a, a variable method or a very, that, that particular model is variable when doing estimation at a particular value. Okay, so um, this is just sort of a rehash of that idea except using K nearest neighbors. So uh, the blue line here is K is five, just in case you can't see that. And the, the orange dash, which, um, I'm gonna represent with my salmon color here is K is 100. So uh, different model type, but we see the same idea. So with K is 100, to make a prediction at any value, we're using a lot of points. So we see that for the three different data sets, we pretty much get the same result. It's, it's a little bit higher, lower each time, so much so you can barely see it probably. Um, whereas with K is five, we're using very few points uh, that we average to make an estimation so with the different data sets, we see they're all very wiggly, but they all wiggle in very different ways. So we would say that that's variable. Okay, oh no, what just happened? That is not relevant here. I hit a different tab on my notes app. Okay, um, right. So let's see, let's see, let's see. Right, what was I talking about? Ah, mean squared error, right. So it turns out that, sort of going back for a second, um, this mean squared error that we defined here, it's actually, it can also be decomposed 
but it decomposes into the bias of the estimator and the variance. Oh, sorry, the bias squared plus the variance. So if we're trying to estimate uh, this mean function at a particular value of x by some estimate, well, the mean squared error there breaks down to be the bias squared plus the variance. So that's interesting. And it turns out there's something called the bias variance trade-off. So um, what the bias variance trade-off is, is that we can say as the bias increases, the variance decreases. Um, so that's if we were sort of saying, uh, if we were going to use different f hats here, uh, if an f hat is more biased, it's going to be less variable. But the trick is that that trade off, as one goes up, the other going down, they don't occur at the same rate. So that means we sort of need to manipulate this relationship to get a good model, which is what we're going to sort of uh, show in a second here. So um, I, I don't remember if we sort of specifically define this idea of model flexibility. Um, and I don't even know if we're going to define it that well here. But we, the, these models that are more wiggly, we call them more flexible. Um, but that's also, these are the models that are more variable. So if I go back again, so clearly K nearest neighbors with K is five, that's a much more flexible model than K nearest neighbors with K is 100. We see K is five, very wiggly, very variable. K is 100, uh, not a lot of variation there. Okay. So now I wanna talk about the relationship between this model flexibility or model variability and the bias of a model. So as model flexibility increases, we see a decrease in the training error. I should technically see, say we don't see it ever increase, but just for simplicity's sake, I'm gonna say it decreases. But we don't see the same in um, validation error. So in the validation error, uh, I don't like that particular curve. Let's do it more like that. So in validation, we see as flexibility goes down, sorry, as flexibility increases, we see the validation error going down, but then it starts coming back up. So um, th this is a pattern you'll sort of see. Um, you often won't see it as such a nice curve and such a nice line decreasing, but um, this is something we're gonna look out for. Okay, so now we can finally talk about this notion of overfitting. And essentially overfitting occurs when a model is too flexible. And what we'll see is that the training error is optimistic. Optimistic. Um, and another way of thinking about this is that we have fit to noise. So I have three representative graphics here. On the far right-hand side, this is uh, some data where I fit k nearest neighbors is one, uh, the black dashed curve is the true regression function. And we can see this is far too wiggly. We fit to the noise. This is very clearly overfitting. Whereas on the left-hand side, I use a large k, that is k is 25. And we see a little bit of wiggle, but not much, especially relative to the true mean function. This is underfitting. Um, and then we sort of have some Goldilocks in the three bears scenario in the middle here. Um, it's not overfitting, it's not underfitting, it's just right. Um, it's not just right, there's some error, but you know, it's doing much better. Okay. So returning to this picture now with uh, perhaps better lines and curves, what I want to say is that, so if we were, you know, uh, fitting a model, like say k nearest neighbors, trying a bunch of different k's, sort of or tuning it, we would say, you know, maybe this amount of flexibility, so whatever k amounts to that flexibility is the model we would and so over here, we're more likely to be overfitting.
because we see, well, the training error says, hey, you're doing great, but we know we have to use unseen data to validate our models. So the validation error is like, oh no, this is no good. And then sort of similarly over here, uh, this is likely underfitting. That is, if we increase the flexibility a little bit, we'd likely get a better validation error, and that would be a better model in general. Okay, so two concepts sort of quickly round out this video, and um, I don't know the order of these videos as I'm making them, but uh, as we dive into R, we'll reinforce all these concepts, so um, be sure to watch that video too. But so I just want to say that um, all these ideas of the bias variance trade-off and this model flexibility thing and this nice picture here, um, it sort of gives us some intuition behind um, why um, we have this validation curve here. But it doesn't tell us what we should do ahead of time before we fit some models to data. So there's, there's this idea that there's no method that will perform best on all possible data sets. I'm massively oversimplifying this, but that's the idea. And this idea is generally referred to as no free lunch. So uh, even though we're explaining sort of how model flexibility relates to validation error and all these things and explaining it, it, it will never explain it in a way where at the end of the day, we're gonna have to fit some models to the data, validate it and see what works best. Um, so uh, that's this idea that there's no free lunch. We're never just gonna come up with this one method that you know all this theory that we just did will lead us to believe that, oh, this is just always gonna work better. Unfortunately, that's not the case. We're gonna have to see some data. We're gonna have to try some models. We're gonna see what works best. It's gonna be a common theme. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is this idea of the curse of dimensionality. Um, so a lot of the examples I've been showing are these nice one dimensional cases. And that's sort of because I'm limited by this two dimensional representation on the iPad. And that sort of makes it harder to talk about high dimensions uh, nicely. But I, I wanna get you at least to be thinking that in high dimensions, some things are gonna break down, um, especially the non-parametric methods we were talking about. I'm actually wondering if I should have put this slide at the end of the non-parametric video. But so there's this kind of idea that says, in high dimensions, any data point won't really have any close neighbors. Because if you're in a super high dimension space, there's just a lot of space. So points get further and further away from each other. Um, and if you think about it, that's really gonna hurt our non-parametric methods. Um, and so um, that's something we're gonna have to be aware of. Um, I just want you to start to think though, that um, in general, for any of these problems, we have some N, which is the sample size. And we also have P, which is the number of features. So if we're in a situation where P is much, much, much smaller than N, we're probably gonna be fine with, you know, pretty simple methods, hit it with a linear model, we'll probably be fine. Um, that's maybe too much of a generalization, but I almost stand by it. But something we're gonna see later in this class is we're gonna look at, at situations where P is like close to N, we're also gonna look at situations where P is bigger than N and so things get difficult in there. Um, but so for now, I just wanna mention that everything we're really talking about right now, uh, is that true? The methods that we're talking about right now work fine in a low dimensional setting. That is P um, reasonably small and often P in relationship to N is what we care about. But as we move into higher dimensions, we'll see um, some things fall apart, um, especially K nearest neighbors, um, but uh, just mentioning this, this now, but uh, something to keep in mind for a later day. Um, okay, I've started to ramble, so that means it's time to end the video. Um, I like to say goodbye, so hello, here I am. Uh, let me put me, it doesn't matter. Anyway, so um, yeah, uh, as always, if you made it to the end of the video, good job, and I'll see you in the next one.